I'd like to welcome everyone this evening. Just thank you for coming and worshiping with us here at Midway. And what a great way to get started with that song this evening with the door. Just that we really know the true meaning of the season this year. And what a great way to get started. So if you would just bow with us and bow your heads in prayer here to get us started this evening. Lord, we're just so thankful that uh, we're able to gather here again at Midway. Just uh, such a blessing to have family and new friends here, just to come to such a great place that we really do get to worship you and just to come adore you. And we just invite you just with open hearts just to come into to the doors here tonight at Midway and to those lives. And just maybe if somebody doesn't know you tonight or just maybe if you're struggling in your own lives that... Uh, we just truly do adore you and just the, we know the reason for this season and the birth of your son, Jesus Christ, and how thankful we are for that. In his name we pray, amen. Well, uh, it's at this time, I'm going to invite my wife to come to the stage, and as well, we're going to invite the kids here tonight uh, to come join us on the platform. We've got a special time for you guys here tonight. You guys come on up and find a seat anywhere. All right. And I'm going to read something to you guys tonight uh, from a book that I read my little girl uh, pretty often, and uh, we're going to read a story about Jesus here tonight. Now, some of you guys are going to hear this story or have already heard this story, but this is a little different. Uh, this isn't right out of the Bible. This is a storybook version of it. So I want to share it with you, though, okay? But it says, Everything was ready. The moment God had been waiting for was here at last. God was coming to help his people, just as he promised in the beginning. But how would he come? What would he be like? What would he do? Mountains would have bowed down, seas would have roared, trees would have clapped their hands, but the earth held its breath. As silent as snow falling, he came in, and when no one was looking, in the darkness he came. There was a young girl who was engaged to a man named Joseph. Joseph was the great, 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 great grandson of King David. One morning, this girl was minding her own business when suddenly a great warrior of light appeared right there in her bedroom. He was Gabriel, and he was an angel, a special messenger from heaven. When she saw the tall man standing there, Mary was frightened. 
You don't need to be scared, Gabriel said. God is very happy with you. Mary looked around to see if perhaps he was talking to someone else. Mary, Gabriel said, and he laughed with such gladness that Mary's eyes filled with sudden tears. Mary, you're going to have a baby, a little boy. You will call him Jesus. He is God's own son. He's the one. He's the rescuer. The God who flung planets into space and kept them whirling around and around. The God who made the universe with just a word. The one who could do anything at all was making himself small and coming down as a baby. Wait, God was sending a baby to rescue the world? But it's too wonderful, Mary said, and felt her heart beating hard. How can it be true? Is anything too wonderful for God? Gabriel asked. So Mary trusted God more than what her eyes could see, and she believed. I am God's servant, she said. Whatever God says, I will do. Sure enough, it was just as the angel had said. Nine months later, Mary was almost ready to have her baby. Now Mary and Joseph had to take a trip to Bethlehem, the town King David was from. But when they reached the little town, they found every room was full, every bed was taken. Go away, the innkeepers told them. There isn't any place for you. Where would they stay? Soon Mary's baby would come. They couldn't find anywhere except an old tumble-down stable. So they stayed where the cows and the donkeys and the horses stayed. And there, in the stable, amongst the chickens and the donkeys and the cows, in the quiet of the night, God gave the world his wonderful gift. The baby that would change the world was born. His baby son. Mary and Joseph wrapped him up to keep him warm. They made a soft bed of straw and used the animal's feeding trough as his cradle. And they gazed in wonder at God's great gift, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Mary and Joseph named him Jesus, Emmanuel, which means God has come to live with us. Because, of course, he had. So how many of you guys are expecting to get presents tomorrow? Maybe something tonight for some of you. But how do you guys get to open something on Christmas Eve? Anybody get to open something on Christmas Eve? Yeah, a couple of you. All right, but the rest of you got to wait till Christmas morning, huh? You'll, you'll make it. It'll be okay. It's just a little while longer. But, you know, the greatest gift that's ever been given is Jesus Christ. And the reason that we give gifts on Christmas Day is because God gave his greatest gift to us. And so we want to honor that and remember it by giving gifts to others as well and giving gifts to those that we love. And so just remember that when you guys are opening presents tomorrow, that nothing that you open tomorrow, I hope you get everything you asked for on your list. I hope you get all the stuff you've been wanting. But nothing you get could be as good and as awesome as the gift that God placed in that little manger when Jesus was born into this world. So I've got a couple of things for you tonight as gifts before we do uh, anything else. But before we do that, could we just celebrate Christmas, just the kids here for just a minute, and show the adults how it's done? Because they're going to sing a song here in a minute. I want you guys to show them how to sing, okay? Can you guys know Joy to the World? Would you sing that with Miss Heather and me? Can we sing Joy to the World together? Okay. All right, let's get you want to get us started. Sure. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. All right, good job, guys. All right, so I've got something for you to take back to your seats with you, one thing and then another, okay? So I'm going to give these to Miss Heather, and she can pass them out to you guys if that's all right. And it's just a little book and some crayons and stickers so you guys can follow along with what we're doing tonight um, and uh, give you something special. And if you don't finish it, take it home with you and work on it tonight uh, while you're laying in bed waiting for Christmas morning to arrive, all right? So it's just got some pictures in there, some uh, some uh, nativity scene things that you can do, and uh, the stickers um, uh, are pictures of the wise men and the stable and things like that, so you guys do whatever you want with them there. Now, some of you guys, let's see, I know one, two, maybe, let's see, I think two of you 
uh, got one of the uh, nativity sets that we uh, gave out earlier in December, right? I mean, you two got that? That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, I don't have enough nativity sets for everybody, but I do have something for everybody up here tonight, okay? All right. So this is your very own painted uh, rock of baby Jesus. And I want you guys to remember that you never know where Jesus is going to show up. You didn't know this was going to be here for you tonight when you got here. But you never know when Jesus is going to show up, and you never know when he's going to do something. So I want you guys to take this home with you, and this will be just a reminder for you from year to year, if you hang on to it, um, about the importance of Christmas. So that tomorrow morning when you guys wake up and you're ready to run downstairs, maybe you'll see this little rock and you'll remember Jesus is the greatest gift of all. All right? So here you go, guys. I'm going to just pass them out to you here with Miss Heather. And when you get it, you guys can go find your seats Merry Christmas, and I hope you guys have an awesome, awesome New Year. All right? There you go. All right. We're thankful for the kids here at Midway and uh, all that they mean to our church. And I wasn't kidding. Uh, We are actually going to sing a song now together, all right? We're going to sing a song that's familiar to the folks here at Midway. Maybe it's not so familiar to some others, but we're going to sing some familiar Christmas carols at the end of the service tonight. But this is one that we often sing here, God with us. Why don't you stand, stretch your legs here for just a minute, and uh, we'll move on. Let's sing this together, God with us.
can please be seated there. And uh, we're going to get into a, just a brief message here in just a moment. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to give you a little bit of a recap, a summary of uh, what we've been going through over the past few weeks. And so I've asked some uh, folks here in our church, Sid and Marty and Julie and Matt and Mike, uh, to come and do a little bit of reading for us to give us a recap uh, of this. So Sid, why don't you come along and get us started. I should pay attention. On a frigid, foggy Christmas Eve in London, a mean-spirited cheapskate named Ebenezer Scrooge works in, his, works in his counting house. Jacob Marley, Scrooge's business partner, has died seven years before. Inside the office, Scrooge watches over his clerk, a poor man named Bob Cratchit. Scrooge follows the same old routine, returning home through the streets of London, which are blanketed in a fog. Just before entering his house, the door knocker on his front door catches his attention. A ghostly image in the curves of the knocker gives the old man a shock. He sees it in the face of Jacob Marley, his deceased business partner. When Scrooge takes a second look, he now sees nothing but a door knocker. Scrooge opens the door and trudges into his bleak home. Scrooge locks the door behind him and puts on his dressing gown. As he eats his gruel before the fire, the carvings on his mantle suddenly transform into images of Jacob Marley's face. Scrooge, determined to dismiss the strange visions, blurts out, Humbug! All the bells in the room begin to ring sharply. Scrooge hears footsteps thumping up the stairs. A ghostly figure floats through the closed door. Jacob Marley, transparent and bound in chains. Scrooge shouts in disbelief. The ghost begins to murmur. He has spent seven years wandering the earth in his heavy chains as punishment for his sins. Marley tells Scrooge that he has come to save him from the same fate. He says that Scrooge will be visited by three spirits. He rises and backs toward the window, which opens almost magically, leaving a trembling Scrooge white with fear. Scrooge sees more spirits, each bound in chains. They wail because of their failure to lead honorable, caring lives. Scrooge stumbles to his bed and falls instantly asleep. Scrooge awakes at midnight. At one o'clock, the curtains of Scrooge's bed are blown aside by a strange, childlike figure. The spirit uses a cap to cover the light that glows from its head. The spirit informs Scrooge that he is the ghost of Christmas past and orders the mesmerized man to rise and walk with him. The pair exits through the window. The spirit transports Scrooge to the countryside where he was raised. They enter a school, the school where a solitary boy, a young Ebenezer Scrooge, passes the Christmas holiday all alone. The ghost takes Scrooge to a past Christmas when the boy in the schoolhouse has grown older. A little girl, Scrooge's sister Fan, runs into the room and announces that she has come to take Ebenezer home. Their father is much kinder and he wants Ebenezer to return home. The spirit escorts Scrooge to more Christmases of the past, including a party thrown by Fezziwig, the man with whom Scrooge worked as an apprentice. Scrooge later sees a slightly older version of himself taking a lovely taking taking with a lovely young woman. She is breaking off their engagement, crying that greed has corrupted Scrooge's heart. The spirit then takes Scrooge to a more recent Christmas scene where this lady, now middle-aged, speaks with her husband about Scrooge. The husband said that Scrooge is now quite alone in the world. Tormented and full of despair, Scrooge seizes the spirit's hat and pulls it firmly over the top of the mystical child's head, dimming the light. 
As the rays of light flood downward on the ground, Scrooge finds himself self zipped back in his bedroom where he stumbles to bed yet again and falls asleep immediately. The clock strikes one. Startling Scrooge awake. Glad to be awake, he hopes to confront the second spirit just as he arrives. Scrooge waits for 15 minutes, after which a bright light begins to shine upon him. Curious, Scrooge walks in the other room where he finds the second spirit waiting for him. The spirit, a huge giant in green robes, sits on a throne made of Christmas feasts. The spirit announces himself as the ghost of Christmas present. The spirit orders Scrooge to touch his robe. Scrooge finds himself alongside the spirit in the midst of the busy city on Christmas morning. People merrily shovel snow, carry bags of presents, and greet one another with Merry Christmas. The spirit then takes Scrooge to the poor home of Bob Cratchit, where Mrs. Cratchit and her children prepare a Christmas goose and save her the few Christmas treats they can't afford. Bob comes in carrying their crippled young son, Tiny Tim, on his shoulders. The family is content, even with the skimpy Christmas feast. The spirit takes Scrooge to a number of other Christmas gatherings. As the night unfolds, the ghost grows older. At least Scrooge and the ghost come to a desolate place. Here, the ghost shows Scrooge a pair of starving children who travel with him beneath his robes. Their names are ignorance and want. Scrooge asks if anything can be done to help them. The ghost mocks Scrooge by quoting Scrooge's earlier hateful statement about the homeless. Are there no prisoners? Are there no workhouses? The spirit disappears as the clock strikes midnight, and Scrooge eyes a hooded figure walking toward him. Finally, here at the last stage, we see the last of the spirits. The last spirit, which is a menacing figure in a black hooded robe, approaches Scrooge. Scrooge asks if the ghost of Christmas is yet to come. The phantom does not answer. Scrooge pleads with the ghost to share his lesson, hopeful it may bring him to redemption. The ghost takes Scrooge to a series of strange places. The London Stock Exchange where a group of businessmen discussed the death of a rich man. A pawn shop in London slum, where a group of shady characters sell the belongings of a recently deceased man. The dinner table of a poor family, where a husband and wife are relieved about the recent passing of their unforgiving landlord. Scrooge begs to know the identity of this man, only to discover that it is him, Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge clutches at the spirit and begs him for another chance just to make things right. He promises to honor Christmas from deep within his heart and to live by the lessons of his past, present, and future. As Scrooge continues to cry out for mercy, the spirit's robe shrinks and collapses. Scrooge again finds himself returned to the safety of his own bed. And so we come to the end of it. Literally, the end of it. That's the name of the chapter. The end of it. All right? And we've been talking about, for the past five weeks, some of the lessons that we can learn uh, from this simple book that we often don't really, um, certainly probably never thought about analyzing and digging into like this like we have over the past five weeks. I hope it's been informational. I hope it's been uh, thoughtful and inspirational as well as we've gone through this. But um, as we wrap up this series, uh, the, this Christmas series of messages, I want to read to you a verse of Scripture, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17 The Bible says this, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so, as we come to this final chapter of the book of Ebenezer Scrooge's encounter, he's met with the spirit of Christmas past, Christmas present. He's met with Jacob Marley. And we, na- and, uh, we, we came to the, the last spirit Christmas yet to come yesterday at church. And he has been confronted over and over again with himself in his own life 
and the failures that he has had in his life, and he's been forced to uh, come face to face, to look in the mirror. As uh, some people say, it's, uh, he has his come to Jesus moments where he has to realize that uh, he is not as well off as he thought for all the money and finances that he had and for all the stability that he had. None of that mattered. None of that uh, made a difference. And so the chapter that we're coming to now, the final chapter, uh, the end of it, it opens uh, with this statement from Scrooge when he awakens in his room and uh, the, the story says that he's, he's clutching the, the, the cloak of the spirit of Christmas yet to come. And as he does it, it changes and it turns into his bedpost. And he's magically trans, uh, transferred back to his room and he says this, I will live in the past, the present, and the future. Scrooge repeated as he scrambled out of bed, the spirits of all three shall strive within me. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. And can I just give you a thought here before we say anything else? The, the, the greatness of the story of Jesus Christ is that it has something to do with the past, the present, and the future. It has to do with your past. It is a, uh, Jesus is the uh, God's way and really the only way of dealing with your past. Everyone in this room carries some form of regret. You carry some form of, uh, of brokenness in your life over something that you've done or maybe something that's been done to you, but um, you have some regret in your life. And the only way to truly deal with that and to put that away forever is to come to Christ. He is the one who helps us deal with our past. For all of the psychology and mechanisms and things that mankind has tried to create through our own reason and rationale and all of those things, and some of those things are good and useful and effective uh, in small doses and at timely moments when they're most necessary, for all that we have tried to create, we have never come up with anything that even comes close to the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It changes lives uh, in our past, in our present, and in our future. It changes your present. It makes a difference in the way that you treat people. At least it ought to. If it's truly making a difference, it will. If you're allowing Jesus Christ to be formed in you and to become like him, then you will uh, be different in the way that you handle life. Will you be perfect? Absolutely not. There's not a person in this room who can truthfully claim that they are without sin in this life at this moment. We're all sinners. That's the whole point of the gospel. That's the whole point of the gospel message is that we're flawed. We're failures at times. We fail. We mess up. But Jesus Christ takes us out of our failures and brings us to his righteousness. And everywhere that we failed, he has succeeded. And he can change our present. He can change the way that we handle our relationships, the way we handle our lives, the way that we handle the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And it changes our future. Because there is coming a day when we are going to leave this world. Last, yesterday we saw uh, Ebenezer Scrooge had to confront that. He had to deal with that. That he wasn't going to be alive forever. And it changed his way of thinking. It changed his, his, his passion in life when he confronted himself with eternity in the hereafter. And so I just wonder, have you ever done that? Have you taken a good look in the mirror and realized that this is not all that there is? I hope that you're financially secure. I hope you're happy and healthy and all those things. But if you have all of that and don't have Christ, you have nothing to show for your life. You have nothing to show for all the work that you've put in and all the effort that you've uh, put into life and family and all those things. So we are called to truly live in the past, the present, and the future. The book ends this way. Scrooge changes if you've read the story or watched the movie, you know how it ends. Scrooge changes. He becomes a, a good man. He falls in love with Christmas, and he falls in love with his family and uh, treats Bob Cratchit the way he deserves to be treated. And the book says it this way. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well. If any man alive possessed the knowledge, may that be truly said of us, in all of us. And so as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. So Scrooge is now a changed man. 
His life is different. He's been transformed by his encounters, these experiences that he's had. And so we need to understand something, though, that the events that we experience in life do not change us, just like the events that Ebenezer Scrooge went through did not change him. Our willingness to react to those events is what changes us. Life Our environment, our situation does not have to be the sum of our existence and the sum of who we are as a person. We can overcome all of those things. We can go beyond all of those things. You are not a victim of circumstance. You are a victim of choice. And we need to learn how to choose to respond in life. How do we do that? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things become possible to those that know Christ. Does everything happen the way we want it to happen? No, absolutely not. But all things become possible where they once were not. Lasting change is a special act of God's grace. The man who says, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be the man I ought to be. I hope you're right, and I hope that happens. But more times than not, that man is good for a little while. He does what he's supposed to do for a little while, and then a couple weeks later he falls back into his old rut, his old routine. Why? Because he hasn't changed. He's tried to change his his situation. He's tried to change the events of his life, his, his schedule, his calendar, whatever. But he hasn't changed. He's the same man that he was. In just about a week, some of us are going to make some New Year's resolutions and we're going to say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to exercise more, I'm going to eat less, I'm going to do all these things, I'm going to you know, spend more time with my family and all those things. And the only way that you're going to follow through on those things is if you change. Not your schedule, not your family, not the people around you, not your job, but if you change, then those things can become possible. Well, how does a person change? By God's grace and by God's grace alone. Only by God's grace can people truly become what we need to be so that we can do the things that we ought to do. So how did Scrooge come to this breakthrough in his life? Just real quickly, think about this. How did he come to this breakthrough? First of all, he faced his past regrets. The spirit of Christmas past took him to his past and showed him, Scrooge, you have no one to blame for who you are but yourself. He had to face his past regrets. He faced his present failures, that he was not living up to his potential. He was not living up to be the person that he should have been. And then he had to face his future fate, that there was coming a day of reckoning. But it was necessary for him to have a moment of special confrontation with those truths. You see, everyone... In life, we know our regrets. We know our failures. We understand, that at least at a head level, at least at a, just an intellectual level, that life will end. We know that to be true. But what we need is for all of that to come to a boiling point. For all of that to come to a special moment of confrontation when we realize, I have to do something about it. I can't continue this way. I refuse to continue this way. I want to do something about this. I want to be different. I want to change. And God, by your grace, help me to change. Only by that special act of God's grace will we make the change. The spirits in the story came to him to convict him and show him his need. But can I tell you this? I believe with all my heart that the Holy Spirit of God allowed you to be here tonight. Maybe so that you could be confronted with your need. Maybe this is your special moment of confrontation. Maybe this is your special moment when your regrets are just more than you can bear. And it's time to release them. It's time to let them go. It's time to plunge them under God's forgiveness and release them to Him. Maybe this is the time where you need to come to the realization that I am not who I should be. I am not the person that I planned to be. And I need God's help to get me the rest of the way. And we all need to come to the reckoning that God is going to take us out of this world someday. Life will end. And when it does, we had better have made our preparations. We had better have gotten that taken care of before we leave this world because once we leave it, there's no going back. 
We have one chance, only one life. It will soon be passed. If you don't know you're on your way to heaven, God has planned for you to be here tonight, to meet with you, and to confront you about your need, to show you that you have a need in your life, just as this fella had a need in his life when he was just a little boy, just a kid. And I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ as just a child. And I tell you, God dealt with my past. He dealt with my present. And he's still dealing with my present. Those of you that have known me for any length of time know that there's still a lot of work to do. And he's, uh, he's already taken care of my future. Scrooge didn't waste the opportunity to make things right with others. And this is your opportunity tonight to make sure that you don't waste your opportunity to get things right with God. This quote was in our church bulletin yesterday, and I want to share it with you. It says, You can never truly enjoy Christmas until you can look up into the Father's face and tell him you have received his Christmas gift. There is no keeping Christmas well unless you have trusted the Christ of Christmas. Then Christmas means something special. It means that God refused to be distant from us and he came to us in our need, in our, uh, in our failures. And he came to be with us, to forgive us, to give us a home in heaven and to just be in our lives, to be a part of our lives. And so this Christmas, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I just encourage you, we're going to have a time of prayer here in just a moment. I would encourage you, accept that confrontation. Accept what God's trying to do in your heart right now. Accept that you have a need for Christ. Believe that God, through Jesus Christ, can forgive your sins, that all of them can be forgiven by his grace. And then confess that to God. Accept that. Receive that for yourself, that I need that forgiveness. And accept it in your life. And we have the promise of God in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that once you are in Christ, You become a new creation of God. Old things are passed away. All those regrets and all that, God's dealt with it. It's no longer in his mind. Yes, we'll have to deal with it. We'll have to deal with the consequences of it. But in God's mind, it's been dealt with. It's been put away with, put away. And all things become new. Literally becoming are becoming new. And God brings up all kinds of new opportunities, new abilities, new, a new life. In Jesus Christ, would you accept that gift this Christmas? Let's pray together for just a moment. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and just take a moment to reflect on this. And Lord, we come to you now and we ask for your help and your grace. Lord, we thank you for the love of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we love you because you first loved us. So Lord, we ask that you would help us now in this time of invitation to be honest with ourselves. To stop fighting against what you're trying to do in our lives, but to just simply lay ourselves before you and say, Lord, I need you. Nothing else will do. Nothing else can take away my sins. I need you. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed here for just a moment, if you're here and you say, Pastor Brian, I'm not 100% sure that if I were to leave this world right now, I'm not 100% sure that I'd be in heaven. I just don't know for sure that I'm saved, that I'm on my way to heaven. If that's you this evening, would you just be brave enough to slip your hand up there for just a moment? I'm not going to confront you. I'm not going to come down and call you down. just want to pray for you. Anybody like that? If you have that need tonight, we're going to have a a few moments here. And as we do that, I'd invite you just to come get me. I'll be right down front here. You can come get my attention. And I'd love to take the Bible and show you how to be saved tonight, how to have all your sins forgiven, not just some of them, but all of them forgiven through God's grace in a moment. We'd love to help you with that. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Pastor Brian, I'm not, uh, I'm not worried about my salvation. I, I, I know that Christ is my Savior, but God's dealing with me about something else. God's working on my heart about something else. If that's you tonight, would you just slip your hand up there? just want to pray for you. Anybody like that? Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for uh, the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ and only through him. Lord, that is your plan and your only plan. There is no plan B. You brought forgiveness to this world through Jesus Christ, and we thank you for it. Lord, we just pray that you would help us now to live in that forgiveness, to live like we've been forgiven. 
And Lord, I pray that you would just help us as we continue in the service tonight to honor you and lift you up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're getting ready for the candlelight portion of our service here in just a moment. And as we do, I'm going to invite uh, my, my helpers up here tonight. Uh, Jimmy and Mary Lou, if you guys could come forward, said, uh, if you want to come forward as well. And uh, Doug and Connie, thank you uh, there as well. If you guys could come forward and help me uh, pass these out here tonight. Um, and what we're going to do is we're just going to have a, a few moments of, of music playing. And as we do uh, have that, um, I'd invite you to come on up and, and grab a candle. Uh, we've got flameless candles if you want that for you or the kids. We've got uh, regular wax candles as well if you prefer that. Uh, but go ahead and uh, make your way this uh, way while the song plays. given to us, but is not meant only for us. It is a light that longs to be reflected, sent out shining into the darkness, so all may come to know it. This light is God's love for us, his love for all. This light is Jesus. For some, Christmas is a time of celebration, it's a time of excitement and energy. For others, it has tones of that and tinges of that, but there's also with it some hurt, some pain that they carry from the loss of someone or something in their life that mattered very dearly to them. 
And we don't want to forget that at Christmas time, that in our reverie, in our excitement, that we forget that there are some who are hurting very deeply. And so tonight, in honor of those who have lost or are hurting this evening even, uh, we light the blue candle in honor of you. I hope you know and understand the Midway Baptist Church loves you in all of your hurt and all of your brokenness, and we'd love to do what we can to be there for you uh, in those difficulties and in those pains. But let's take a moment here before we dismiss tonight and sing some songs, uh, some familiar Christmas carols about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we sing a three Christmas songs here tonight. And we'll start with It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. It came upon the midnight clear that glorious song. try to find the right key here. That'd be good. All right, give me the first bar. Why don't you sing it?
years ago, they asked me to preach, not sing. So I'm glad I've got Heather. She's the talent in the family, I tell you. All right, Silent Night. Let's sing this. Yeah, this will be our final song here tonight. Then we'll close in prayer. candles together tonight and we're going to be dismissed in a word of prayer again thank you for being here tonight and uh, we ask for God's special blessing upon you be in prayer for those tonight who are hurting who are carrying uh, difficulties in their lives right now and uh, let's be uh, faithful to remember them Uh, but let's be dismissed tonight in a word of prayer and uh, I'm going to ask brother Doug Gilworth if you would lead us in prayer as we close tonight God bless you as you go. Have a...